to the Crooked Table Podcast, where we discuss the world of film from a fresh angle. And now your host, Robert Yanis Jr. Welcome to the Crooked Table Podcast. This is Rob. On this show, we democratize the film criticism conversation by bringing on fans and critics alike and digging into their personal connection to a current or classic release. You can find more episodes of the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and other podcatchers. Also, leave us a rating and review on Apple if you get a chance. Really appreciate it. And this week, I am honored to welcome back to the show, Sandro Fauci. Welcome back. Thank you so much for having me back. It's going to be fun. So we talked about Popstar, uh, I think, like last fall. Like basically, I think we, we recorded that conversation in October or so. And, you know, you dropped me an email out of nowhere being like, hey, I was thinking about what we should talk about. And I picked Machete. And I was like, <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> that sounds perfect. Yeah, um, I, was, I was thinking about it a lot during the year. Like, I want to go back on, but I want it to be the perfect movie yeah. that would make complete sense with like what we're doing on the podcast as well as something that I think that you know we would we both have a lot to talk about and just Machete came to mind out of nowhere because I think Rodriguez mentioned in an interview that he was still working on the third one and, and I went oh yeah I love those films let's talk about that that'd be awesome so yeah I just dropped you an email out of nowhere <laughs> yeah no that's awesome and I, I will get into uh, Rodriguez and Trejo and the whole grindhouse thing in a moment. So tell people a little bit about who you are and you know, what your show is about and what you have going on in case they didn't, they missed our last conversation. For sure. Uh, yeah, the podcast I do one of two podcasts at the moment, actually I've started up a second one in the last couple of months. Uh, it is called oldie, but a goodie. It's with my friend, Zach. Uh, we've been podcasting for about nine years now, and this is our latest project where we are watching movies from the year 1984 in the order of release. Last year was 1994. Uh, and this year we're doing 1984, and it's been a wild ride. There's been some films that have been excellent. There's been a lot of bad. There's been a lot of times we've disagreed on something. Perhaps one of us had nostalgia for a movie, and Mm -hmm. the other one didn't, and so we're there arguing about The NeverEnding Story, for example, (laughs) which came out recently. Um, Yeah, and it's been a lot of fun, and I think these two Machete movies really do fit in with the year 19... 84 because there's a lot of just ultra violent ridiculous uh i don't want to necessarily use the term low budget because the machete movies aren't but in the 80s films like this certainly weren't low budget and it's just right in that uh kind of grindhouse era of cinema and it's been a lot of fun yeah, I'll have to listen to some of your 1984 episodes because I was I was actually born in 83. So I grew up with a lot of like Never Ending Story, a lot of those early mid 80s movies. So I'll have to check that out. That sounds awesome. And this year with this as crazy as as the world is these days, 1984 <laughs> feels like the right choice uh, for a number of reasons. But yes. Um, so before we get into Machete, I wanted to talk about what what is kind of your relationship with Robert Rodriguez as a filmmaker and Danny Trejo since they are so intertwined? Mm, yeah, uh, I've been a massive fan of Rodriguez since I was very young. I mean, Spy Kids is one of the first franchises I ever really got into, I think, which sounds weird to say considering that I was probably too young to get into a franchise, but whatever. Um, I loved all three of those. Two was always my favorite, but I didn't yeah. have a, a I actually, soft spot. I actually agree with that. I think two is slightly better than one and, and certainly better than three, but I, I, I also <laughs> enjoy those. I also enjoy that franchise. Uh, I actually went back recently and watched the fourth one for the first time. I had I missed it when it oh, came wow. out, and whew, it's a big drop in quality there. But, but yeah, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> yeah, the were. fourth one, I don't think I've ever finished it, but one day I'll go through all four again because I haven't – I went back to three – uh, a couple of years ago, just because I wanted to see how the visuals held up, and they do not hold up at no, all. But I just no, no, I no. love how <laughs> awful that movie looks because I'm pretty sure it looked terrible at the time. Like that and Shark Boy and Lava Girl got critic reviews saying how bad they looked at the time they came out, and so I feel like they've kind of eclipsed that now, and they look so terrible that it's amazing. They it came like back Phoebe around Jones. again, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and that's another one that I loved when I was much younger as well, Shark Boy and Lava Girl, which is why I'm, uh, in, I, I'm excited is the wrong word, but I'm very interested to see how this sequel is going to go that was just announced at Comic-Con. Mm-hmm. 
We Can Be Heroes, I think a Netflix thing that he's doing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then on top of that, uh, Sin City, I've also got a pretty soft spot for that because that was one of the first ever super stylized movies I ever saw. I probably watched it too young, but uh, that was like one of the first ever uh, movies. That kind of introduced me to Tarantino as well with the Mm -hmm. short segment that he directed in that as well. And then um, like most recently stuff like Alita and, and the Grindhouse films as well. Just, yeah, I've just always been a big fan of Rodriguez's style. It doesn't always work. There's quite a few films in his filmography that don't quite land, but for the most part, I think he doesn't really compromise on his vision and the level of energy he brings to a film is just always something that I look forward to. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I got into his stuff. I, I, you know, when Desperado came out, I was 12 and I don't even remember when I saw that exactly, but at some point on video, I got really big into that from dusk till dawn, the faculty and then, yeah, like you were just saying, he he brought that same level of like kinetic energy and like, you know, the fact that he he had his famously, you know, wrote, directed, produced, shot, scored, the, you know, did like kind of everything. It was like a one man filmmaking yeah. crew, basically. He even has a book about it, which I've read. Um, he, you know, he has he's able to translate that sort of uh I don't know. Energy is the best word for it, but that sort of <laughs> that sort of vibe from something like Desperado or Dust Till Dawn over to the Spy Kids films, and mm-hmm. I think he he balances it really well in those first two, and then right over Spy Kids 3D. Like it's, later on, it's he just his filmmaker his filmography just like splits into Sin City, Planet Terror, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then Shark Boy and Lava Girl, which I was obviously too old for at the time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Shorts. And which I still haven't seen because I, I, I don't know, at this certain point, I just broke with his kids movies. I was just like, OK, this won't be for me. And then <laughs> it felt like he he lost it a little bit like uh, Machete Kills, which we'll talk about. I enjoyed quite a bit, but it didn't do very well at the box office, which is why mm. the, you know, the delay on the third one. Sin City, uh, the Dame to Kill for came about uh, basically like five years too late. Uh, and Alita, I think is, I feel like is exciting because it, it did feel like a return to form for him in a long, uh, in a, in a big way. Like the, the best thing I'd seen from him since probably, you know, probably, uh, the grindhouse machete early that like, mm. it's been a while since he's been up to that level. And I feel like he's starting to kind of work his way back. Now he's, uh, slated to direct an episode of the Mandalorian season two. So yes, that immediately, very conne- excited for. That's yeah, awesome. that, that immediately clicked to me. I was like, this guy could totally handle us a, a Star Wars movie. Like if okay. they do what they did with Taika Waititi and they start him on Mandalorian and then they to give him out his own movie, he would be such a great fit for that. Just because he's done so much. Like he he's done um family friendly action. He's done the effects. He's done like he's handled a lot of that. So I'm I'm really excited to see what his career uh I guess resurgence sort of now brings mm-hmm. about because he has he had a lot to offer back in the day and I think it's just kind of, you know, everything in Hollywood is cyclical, I guess. So he's coming back around now. Yeah, yeah. And there's that film uh, he did last year, I think, which he wrote with his son called Red Eleven, which I haven't seen because it's just not available anywhere in Australia at the moment. Um, but but that also looks like a bit of a return to form. I think it was super low budget as well. And from what I've read, it looked like it it feels just like his earlier stuff. So it definitely seems like he's going back to like what got him into directing in the first place, which I think is perfect. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, Danny Trejo, the lead leading uh, star of the machete films. (laughs) It's like, I think he's, he's a cousin of Rodriguez, but I forget exactly second or third cousin and has been in most of his films what do you? What is kind of your experience with Danny Trejo? When did you first really discover him? I think it was Con Air, the first time I saw him, and immediately I went, "This guy is cool," and I want to see more of the stuff <laughs> he's done. And I've just always kind of followed him since then. Like most recently, it's more been through his TV appearances. I remember he was um pretty great in Brooklyn Nine Nine. I loved him in. Uh, the few episodes he is in of The Flash. I don't really follow that show anymore, but when he was on it, like his episodes mm-hmm. were great. He was basically playing Machete. Uh, <laughs> kind of, yeah. In that show, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and stuff like 
Breaking Bad as well. He's obviously great in that. Uh, I, I just love that he's playing the same character as he, he is in Spy Kids. It doesn't mm-hmm. really line up, but it's the same character, apparently. So that's great. Yeah, yeah. And because of the, it's got the same last name, but the family uh, life is different. Like, he doesn't have any family machete, at least according to the movies. Um, but it makes that moment in Machete Kills with uh, Antonio Banderas really awkward because it's, you know, I'm sort of in my head <laughs> doing the mental gymnastics is like, is that, does he think that's Gregorio? Like what's, how are they going to yeah. play this scene? Like, cause I hadn't rewatched the movie in a while. Um, but no, I think I love Danny Trejo whenever he, he's one of those people that whenever he shows up, you, you get it, you know, it, it just adds an extra level of enjoyment to whatever the project is. And he has mm. that, um, he has that versatility where obviously he has that tough guy look and persona on screen, uh, because he's left, you know, he's lived a very, interesting life there's a documentary that i wanted to get a chance to watch before this episode but i rewatched grindhouse and both machetes i was like i can't fit in any more homework for this one episode (laughs) but he's got there's a documentary about him called inmate number one that i believe just got released on demand um because he's done you know he's been in prison he was a gang member he had like you know substance abuse problems and things like that so i'm like really want now he's got taco shops and like donut in california he's like a mogul now um, so I, I'd really want to hear more about his story, but he's just got so much character on his face and he has that versatility between, you know, playing, uh, an assassin like he does in Machete, like he does in Desperado, like he, you know, he's the, uh, the bartender in From Dusk Till Dawn. And he's, I think the only uh, actor that's in all three of those movies, they had two straight to video, uh, sequels. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and also, you know, it's can shift to comedy on a dime. I remember him showing up in, uh, what is it? Harold and Kumar, the, uh, whatever the Christmas one is. Um, <laughs> and it's just, you know, I, I love, I, he just he got an inherent likability about him, uh, whenever you see him in a movie. So the fact that at the age of, I think 66, when, when Machete was released, he's now getting his first lead role. I thought that was so cool, uh, for a variety of reasons, That, you know, he's a Latin man uh, in his 66 years old at that age, like lead in in a major, you know, action movie. But also that they, you know, it's kind of one of those, the son of a bitch did it moments with Rodriguez (laughs) making the trailer from Grindhouse into a movie. So when did, did you see Grindhouse uh, in theaters? Was it released there in theaters? Uh, It was, but not in the way that it was meant to be released. Uh, I think they were separate releases and uh the trailers were pretty much taken out they're Mm. on the dvd release and there is a cinema in melbourne called the aster which does every now and then play them both back to back with the trailers like it's meant to be seen Mm -hmm. um they also do stuff like the original version of the hateful eight which like with, with like the extra half hour of footage or something. They always do that stuff for, uh, <clears throat> for Tarantino's work. Um, but yeah, I was familiar with the Machete trailer as a fake trailer. Uh, I think when it came out, I, I, I can't remember exactly when I saw Grindhouse for the first time. It was a bit later. Um, but as soon as I saw it, I went, that looks like a fun movie. And I would mm-hmm. watch that if it came out. Oh wait, it does exist. Well, I'm going to go watch it now. <laughs> it was something like that for, uh, yeah, f- for that trailer yeah when grindhouse came out i was just right at the, like the the peak of my rodriguez fandom and the peak of my tarantino fandom because uh they were both coming off of sin city and the kill bills mm. uh so i was just like so like so hyped for grindhouse i think i, I remember buying the the title the main title track on itunes back in the day and just like putting that thing on blast, like on a loop while I was doing working stuff on the computer. Like <laughs> no lie. Like I was so excited to see that movie um, just because, you know, I was familiar with the grindhouse phenomenon, but of course that was before my time and, and j- just the chance to get a new movie from both of those filmmakers sort of aping that style. And I do feel like from dusk till dawn was sort of the predecessor to grindhouse in a lot of ways, just because the first half is, you know, it's written by Tarantino, that that movie, and directed by Rodriguez. The first half is very much a Tarantino movie. The second half is very much a Rodriguez movie. So it sort of <laughs> feels like that was kind of the seed of of the idea that then grew into Grindhouse. Um, but yes, they, yeah, I had a feeling that they didn't, you know, really give it a proper release over there because I know that 
uh, here, it took them a long time for the home video release to to be you know packaged together to, to mimic yeah. the theatrical experience. I I actually have the DVDs of the the um, Planetary and Death Proof separately, and then the Blu-ray of uh, Grindhouse. So it's mm. which of um which of those two films, by the way, did you actually prefer? I I don't know really. Uh, They're very I different, think, right? Yeah, I am more of a fan of Tarantino's style uh, of filmmaking, but Death Proof has always kind of felt like the sore thumb in his filmography mm-hmm. separately, which is why I think I think they work so well together because they are very different but very alike because they are obviously trying to copy that Grindhouse style of filmmaking. I, I, I have a hard time separating them. I don't think I've ever watched them separately as well. I think I've always yeah. watched them back to back. Yeah. They definitely don't play. Like if you watch them together, it's, it, it's definitely a, a, you know, one of, it's an instance of the sum being greater than its parts. Like they, they do complement each other. Well, where if you watch them individually, it, it just doesn't have the same impact. Just, and I don't know if that's, if that's a testament to, you know, the, what that says about the quality of the films themselves. <laughs> I think yeah. it's just really, you know, when it comes to that kind of, movie you're not really going in there for i don't know you're not really going watching it from a critical through a critical lens you're just more like i want to have an experience so yeah give me the trailers give me the like fake advertisements in between like i want to be i want you to simulate what it was like in the 70s sitting in like these cd theaters and and just watching some crazy shit women went chains or like you know we'll talk about the trailers in a second all of that stuff. And it, for me, just seeing it in theaters in 2007 was an amazing experience. I'd still put it as one. Like, it was such a an interactive audience. I think on the uh, on the video release of uh, the DVD or Blu-ray of uh, Planet Terror, that Rodriguez does include the audience reaction track. Mm. It's so you the, can... <laughs> it's on the DVD uh, release of Machete as well. There is like an Oh, yeah. I think, I, think I forgot that. track in there as well. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, with the the grainy screen thing and like the the sound of it, like everything about it is, I really love that that idea of mm. trying to give people an experience that uh, you know open open people open mainstream audiences up to that kind of like you know cult movie vibe, and I it didn't really work very well for them. I don't think that <laughs> hit at the box office as much as they were hoping or expecting. I don't. Uh, I don't know what they were really thinking. I don't know who thought that movie was going to be like a hundred million dollars or something, but I think they <laughs> yeah. thought maybe the hype behind Rodriguez and Tarantino together would take it there. But uh, did you have any thoughts on uh, like any overall thoughts on the movies themselves before we talk about the trailers real fast? Um, not particularly really. I, I wanted to rewatch them for the episode, but just didn't uh, have time, unfortunately. But right. um, yeah, I just, I think they're a lot of fun. I think if you're looking at them, as you said, in a critical lens, they don't hold up. But that's kind of the point, maybe, as yeah, well. Yeah, I think so. Uh, y- yeah. And also, they did get me into the whole, like, B-movie exploitation uh, era uh, of films. After watching that, I've always kind of had a soft spot for <laughs> for terrible films like that uh, and go back to them quite frequently. So, yeah, I think um, they are interesting pieces of cinema that are a lot of fun, but definitely not for everyone. Um, In some ways, I think maybe the Machete films are a good introduction to that style of filmmaking that then you would go back to Grindhouse to watch. I think maybe you could take the Machete films as an introduction to Grindhouse rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. It's yeah. it's just yeah it's so funny watching it now like in 2007 it was already pushing like pushing the boundaries of certain things but now in in this whole ha- uh, hashtag me too like politically correct culture like watching all of these movies I was just like whoa oh, yeah. <laughs> it's good thing that's intentional because yikes y'all would be super canceled if that was the, yeah if that was the case um to some of the cast members on their own as well you're like, oh i Whoa. know i was no i was just telling my wife that earlier today i was watching machete kills i was like charlie sheen will gibson amber heard there's an elon yes. musk cameo at the end i was just like wow 
Ye- yeesh. There's, um, <laughs> yeah, the cast members are, yeah. <laughs> we'll it's a lot. It. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, it's like Steven God. Seagal's first uh, theatrically released movie since like 2002 as well for the first one. Right, which was funny because he'd been turning down uh, the villain role, I think, in in the Expendables movies, which mm. in a lot of ways, those movies try to be like the Machete vibe a little bit, like with that testosterone, like throwback action thing. But they don't, I don't, they don't, they take themselves too seriously overall in Expendables movies, yeah. I think. Like, I enjoy those because yeah. I grew up with all those guys, but they, yeah, those, that, those movies, they try and be like, like uh you know meditative on the whole thing and it doesn't work especially the first one i think the second one kind of found that balance a little better but seagal turned those down and then does this one uh gibson does machete kills and then the next year is like in his expendables three playing very yeah. similar kind of character um but yeah we're, we're getting off track now um <laughs> the, the the trailers themselves so machete obviously we'll mm. get into so we have uh werewolf women of the ss don't and thanksgiving there's also hobo with a shotgun which was like a totally separate thing but of yeah. the three main ones what are you, which is your your favorite of the 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 three trailers i know we're, um, rob zombie uh, edgar wright and uh, eli roth um i'm not a fan of rod zombie usually same here, and actually. I'm, and I'm definitely more a fan of Edgar Wright and Elon and uh, and Eli Roth. I almost said Elon Musk then for a second. I don't know why. <laughs> um, but I think Rod Zombie's one's my favorite just because it's so spot on with right. the sort of film that that trailer would be for. So I think that one's my favorite, although the other two are films that I would watch. Whereas right. I probably wouldn't watch Werewolf Women of the SS, but I think that trailer is so spot on with uh, the vision of Grindhouse. Well, you have the also, yeah. especially in that one, you have the Nicolas Cage uh, as Fu Manchu. Yeah. Again, cancelled. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, but I, I, 100%, I 100% agree. Like, over the years, there's been murmurs of, of Eli Roth doing a Thanksgiving movie. And I'm always like, yes, please do that. That would be so awesome. It feels like he shot half a movie already anyway. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, the werewolf woman of the SS is the only one that I'm like, I, I feel like you're not going to get a better version of that experience than you do in this mm. like two minute footage. Exactly. Yeah. But, exactly. but yeah, um, I don't mind the, have you seen the hobo with a shotgun movie? I actually in have. It, I actually yeah. have. It's, it's, it's an interesting one. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been it's, a while since I've seen it, but yeah, I yeah I remember um I remember seeing a poster for it in uh, my v- local video rental store. That's a bit of a throwback for you. <laughs> uh, I remember seeing a poster for it and going, "Isn't that in that Grindhouse film I saw the other day?" Interesting. <laughs> like I just remember seeing seeing the poster and going, "They made that. How about that?" I've never seen it. I really should. Um, it, yeah, yeah to complete it, the grindhouse experience i guess yeah it looks fun i think <laughs> yeah i mean yeah it's it's it, that's the thing it, it, as long as they're as long as these movies are not boring it's kind of a win basically mm. and and some of them some of them you just they feel like they're worth making just because of the title i mean literally yes. hobo with a shotgun that that the fact that that's a movie just you know i i recently like last year i finally watched uh wolf cop which is like a canadian horror comedy uh and it has very similar sort of grindhousey vibe to it low budget Mm -hmm. ridiculous over the top uh (laughs) they have another they have a sequel called another wolf cop which i also watched Um, another wolf cop that's a great (laughs) sequel title (laughs) um but yeah so i have a little bit and i think my interest in these kinds of movies was definitely spurred on in large part by grindhouse and mm. by just my, you know, my fandom for those two directors and seeing what, what, you know, how they were trying to emulate the movies that they grew up with as, as kids and stuff. So, uh, yeah, I think that that's, um, it's, it's an interesting experience that I think, you know, we're, unfortunately we're losing a little bit. I feel like those kinds of movies aren't really being made or if they are being made, they're not really being seen very much yeah. because you don't have, you know, that they're not hitting theaters basically is what I'm saying. Like, especially, well now we're nothing's hitting theaters, but mm. uh, generally it's like the big budget movies and, and the, you know, the big marquee stars and everything else is kind of going to streaming pretty much. So it's, it's unfortunate that we're sort of losing that. And that could be probably part of, 
and this will transition into a machete itself, why we're not getting more traction on uh, machete kills again in space. <laughs> uh, but so uh, I think that's that's kind of a good segue. Let's listen to the original Grindhouse trailer from Grindhouse for Machete uh, to lead into our discussion of those films. They called him Machete. $70 a day for yard work. 100 for roofing. Get in. 125 for septic. Sewage. Have you ever killed anyone before? As you may know, illegal aliens such as yourself are being forced out of our country at an alarming rate for the good of both our people. Our new senator must die. And for that, I will pay you $150,000. Cash. He was given an offer he couldn't refuse. I cost the most. Because I'm the best there is. Set up, double-crossed, and left for dead. I took a vow of peace. And now you want me to help you kill all these men? Yes, bro. I mean, Padre. I'll see what I can do. He knows the score. Where are my wife and daughter? He gets the women. And he kills the bad guys. Oh, shit. You knew that a Mexican day laborer is a goddamn federal! But they soon realize... He's coming after us. They just fucked with the wrong Mexican. Action. Suspense. Emotion. Please, Father, have mercy. God has mercy. I don't. If you're gonna hire a machete to kill the bad guy, you better make damn sure the bad guy isn't you. Machete. Rated X. So this is based on an old script from that Rodriguez had lying around from 1993. He actually co-directed this one, which I, I always forget with uh, a gentleman mm -hmm. named Ethan Menekis. Uh So I don't I'm just curious. I wonder what that was about. I think he was probably working on something else at the time. Um, so when yeah. you went to see this movie, obviously you had seen the trailer. What was your expectations and did the you know 2010 full length machete meet them <laughs> um i uh, i my expectations were well i wasn't too sure because based off the grindhouse double feature i was expecting something quite similar to planet terror and that's not really what you get here um it it very much feels like an ultra violent james bond exploitation film <laughs> very much though very much so. uh so yeah, I, I wasn't really sure what to expect, but I saw the cast and I think I built some expectations off that just based off the names and, and it, it didn't necessarily live up to that, which I think is the great thing about the cast is the casting does feel quite strange when you just read the cast list, even if it's just like watching the, um, the opening credit sequence, you're like, what is that person doing? <laughs> Lindsay Lohan's in this? <laughs> Yeah, come yeah. on. And then, like, you uh, eventually watch it, and it makes sense. Um, so I think, yeah, it didn't live up to my expectations, but that's one of the reasons why I like it so much is because it did kind of feel like it came out of nowhere. It was very uh, fresh, um, for want of a better term, considering the style of film it is. Um, and, yeah, I, j I just remember having a lot of fun with it and it being something that I revisited quite often after that initial viewing. Yeah, I think, I, I don't know if Robert Rodriguez used this term or where I, I heard it, but I did not coin it. But someone called it mexploitation, which is very much what this is. Like, it plays into uh, not only, you know, Mexican stereotypes, but also 
actually weirdly has we you know we were kind of saying this i think right before we started recording weirdly has a very strong subtext uh, of like political commentary like in a mach- in a machete movie uh yeah. we, it talks you know talking about immigration and there's you know robert de niro starring as uh, senator mclaughlin and his whole <laughs> building a wall thing which many several years before robert de niro would make headlines by like cursing out Trump every chance he got, he would get. Uh, mm. I think it, it's so funny to see De Niro basically playing, uh, playing him in this movie with very much the, the, you know, strong stance on immigration and, and how the politics really drive this whole movie. It is, like you said, it is very much a, a James Bond grindhouse movie. I mean, um, Danny Trejo is like sleeping with women left and right. And, and yeah. the second one really leans into that where he's like, kind of jet setting and and has uh amber heard as a handler and all that stuff yeah it's um yeah it's 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 weird how how much the movie actually strangely kind of has to say you know what i mean yeah it 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 almost feels like a parody satire of right. the sort of film that's making and it yeah it feels very relevant despite it also feeling quite dated which is obviously on purpose as well right it's yeah. just like it it hits it just perfectly just like it hits exactly what it wants to be and it probably shouldn't work as well as it does but it really does mm-hmm. no i think so too and we have the uh, the opening sequence here is very much sort of a classic revenge story set up we get the 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 we get the crazy <laughs> violence right from the front right from from the jump uh is there a particular moment in this movie like a, a a kind of wild like i can't believe they just did that moment in this movie that really stands out to you because i i have one ready to go oh it's the intestine thing isn't it? thank you <laughs> yes it is it 100 percent is <laughs> if, if not if anything else if anything i feel like they should have had more moments like that like really go for it i felt like in a way mm the final movie felt kind of safer than I thought it would be. Cause you have in the grindhouse trailer, they're really playing up. They just fucked with the wrong Mexican and they have like the rated X at the end and everything. <laughs> so you'd think that they would lean into that even more, but, but yeah, I, I love that moment. It's so out of nowhere. Uh, yeah, it's so fun. It's great. I love the setup as well because he's in the doctor's room and the doctor's like, hey, by the way, did you know that the human intestine is like three times or like four times this, the length of the human body? Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> and they, it comes back in the second one as well where he says um, something along the lines of, did you know the average human passes gas 14 times a day but that never comes back they don't do like anything with that really well they have the the moment in uh, the second one where he cuts the guy and and he throws his intestines into the helicopter and then it like pulls him up there's a lot of helicopter stuff happening in the second one actually uh but yeah i i and and that doctor was is also in planet terror and mm. there's there the the two nurses who I think are like his Rodriguez's nieces or something in real life. Like there's a lot yeah. of constant there's a lot of strange uh con- like continuity links between Machete, Planet Terror, uh Death Proof, like um mm. to Dawn and uh and the other movie. There's there's a lot of Rodriguez callbacks in there too that I think is makes it yeah. makes it a lot of fun. Yeah, there's a um, there's a character called Edgar McGraw, I think, who is in Dust Till Dawn, Grind, uh, Death Proof, and then I think Kill Bill as well. Mm-hmm. I think, yeah. So th- th- there is a bit of continuity throughout this whole film, but but then also there isn't because it is technically a Spy Kids spinoff. <laughs> yeah, and there isn't really continuity there, but there's continuity with yeah the other films <laughs> that we just mentioned. And it really enhances your enjoyment of the Spy Kids movies if you watch the first one and you're thinking to yourself, oh, shit, this is Machete, that guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the guy, yeah, the <laughs> the Mexican James Bond who went to space, I guess. I like, um, I like how in this one, Machete is just kind of going along with everything. <laughs> like some guy comes up and is like, get in the car and he's like, all right, fine. I guess I'm going to go do this. Like he doesn't question anything. And it goes into the second one as well. He's just there to kill mm-hmm. people. That's the reason he exists really. 
and they don't really try to add in any backstory. There's obviously the revenge stuff, but aside from that, you don't really know what his deal is. He's just going from scene to scene, killing people. That's his whole deal. And he doesn't question anything. And I think it just makes it so much more enjoyable. Yeah. Well, I mean, and Danny Trejo is the perfect, you know, the perfect person to pull that off because he looks scary, like without having to do anything. Like all he has to do is grimace at you. And you're like, oh shit, this guy is, we did fuck with the wrong Mexican. But it's like every movie starts out with him losing a a girl. And then the second one, what I love about the second one, and I forgot about this, is that early on he gets caught by like, you know, the redneck sheriff played by William Sadler and he's had him hanging there, and and the uh, I think the other cop is something like, oh, this guy he doesn't die. Basically, it's become part of Machete's mythos that he's like basically a a Jason Voorhees figure. That it's you can shoot him, yeah. you can. I mean, he gets sh- shot up in midway through the movie, and then wakes up in Luth- in Luther Vaz's <laughs> healing pool, and he's just like all better, yeah. like stronger than ever. So I love that they lean into that, and they're just like, yeah, no, he's invincible. That's his thing. He's, he literally is a you know machete and all. Uh, he is a, like a Jason Voorhees, but for you know Mexican immigrants and and you know the, yeah. the U.S. He gets uh, citizenship in the in the first, in the second movie in the beginning, and um, yeah, it's it's so crazy. I love it. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Um, speaking of uh, kind of like a mythical characters there's of course michelle rodriguez in this as well as the leader of the revolution yeah the network the leader of the network i love yeah and she's was right in her you know fast and furious zone at this point too so she's kind of banking off of uh that that kind of uh momentum from that franchise yeah definitely i think particularly in the first one she's probably got my favorite performance out of the whole film because she's perfectly likable and you get the danger there like when she is in the action sequences like everything works perfectly with michelle rodriguez i think in the second one maybe they did underuse her a little Mm -hmm. bit but that could have been because she was probably filming something else at the time and couldn't really commit to a full film i'm not too sure but um in the the first one yeah she's fantastic yeah that could be honestly that could be sort of a a maybe a, a flaw of the second movie that you don't really have a consistent female lead in, in the first, uh, in, in the second one, the first one you have Jessica Alba, uh, Sartana, Sartana, just kind of, you know, making, having her arc being that she's, you know, obviously a, a Latin woman working to like, you know, deal with the immigrants and sort of flipping sides that, you know, she's kind of working for the wrong side. That kind of, kind of deal is, is her storyline. And in the second one you have, uh, a little bit of Amber Heard, a little, well, a little bit of Jessica Alba for like five minutes, a little bit of like Amber Heard yeah. as like the female, like the, I guess, machete girl, if we're going with the Bond, uh, the Bond analog here. <laughs> and then Rodriguez, Michelle Rodriguez, not Robert, uh, for the, like the last act, basically. And you don't have really a consistent presence throughout the entire film. I, guess, I think that may, might hurt the whatever air quotes narrative of the second one um just a, just <laughs> a little no bit that's what well <laughs> but he needs somebody to play off of because yeah uh, machete is, as a character is so not passive is not the right word because he's killing people like crazy there's like a, a body count of i think uh, i think on imdb it says like 98 for the first one and like 100 and something for the <laughs> second one so i mean clearly wow he's got a lot of uh rage to deal with but um yeah. But yeah, because he isn't particularly vocal or expressive, I guess is the right word. He he needs someone to really play off of, and the second one doesn't really give him sort of a uh, you know a supporting a, a supporting player to to connect with a, a lot of the time. Yeah, not really. I mean, there is um, Marcos Mendez in the first half, and I think they work very well together. I, like he's one of my favorite things about that second film. It's so ridiculous and. I love the moment where uh, I think he switches personalities for like the fourth time <laughs> and Machete is just like, how many are you? Like, how many are there in there? And it's it's a good moment. Um, but yeah, that is definitely a thing with the second one. There isn't a consistent, uh, yeah, like sidekick. There isn't really anything consistent in the mm-hmm. second one either, which I don't mind i like how a balls the walls insane that second film is like the decisions that rodriguez makes are ridiculous 
Um, but he, it doesn't feel, yeah, like a cohesive film, which is why I think the first one works so well, is that it does have something to say. It's got great performances all throughout it. Uh, it does have a plot that does feel very reminiscent of Grindhouse, but also quite uh, up-to-date with stuff like The Wall um, and everything that uh, De Niro is is doing. I think, yeah, the, the, the first one, as I said before, it doesn't feel like it should work, but it really does. Every aspect of it works very well. Yeah, it feels like something... It feels like the kind of issue-driven grindhouse movie that would be made to like we were saying to satirize or comment or exploit the the issues of the day so if you know immigration mm. is, is obviously still something we're dealing with a big you know topic of discussion it feels like a movie that would come out to sort of cash in on oh everybody's talking about this let's make a crazy movie about you know this mexican ex-federale who who gets wrapped up in a political conspiracy and goes ape shit this brings up a good good question that i wanted to get into and i guess you sort of already answered it but it's which of these movies ultimately is is a better film and i i'm I'm tend i think the better movie is machete the first one easily like objectively a better movie but i feel like in a way the second one is almost more fun just because it is so like scattershot i mean we're going from (laughs) damien uh bashir as Mendez, who I think is the performance of the movie. Like he's not in it nearly enough. (laughs) I wanted him the whole way through, maybe at least till, till the, you know, the final act. Uh, Sofia Mm. Vergara as a, uh, you know, a madam with like, um, mini guns on her breasts and her strap on, which was, um, (laughs) which is another callback to from dust till dawn and Desperado. That's another Rodriguez thing that he likes to, to pop in whenever he can. You have a, a, uh, face changing villain played by uh, Antonio, yeah, yeah, played by Antonio Vanderas, <laughs> Lady Gaga, Cuba Gooding Jr., and the first time I think I've ever saw Walton Goggins in a movie. I the chameleon is always one of my favorite. Like that, <laughs> it doesn't make any no, sense, no. but it just works so perfectly. And like I love um, Lady Gaga as an actress. I think. She is so perfect in this and in stuff like American Horror Story, where she can basically play mm-hmm. herself, but with like a dark twist. And her performance in this is just fantastic. I mean, she she barely says anything, but just her facial expressions and the way that she walks and performs around everything just fits the madness perfectly. Yeah, yeah. And and if they're going for this sort of stunt casting. The fact that they have Lady Gaga randomly, who had never done a movie before, uh, in this movie, just like it's like the first one where you're like Lindsay Lohan, you're like what, Lady Gaga, so you have Lady Gaga and Mel Gibson and all of this like in the same movie. It's like how does that how does that happen? Um, and then of course you know in the trailer for the third one, it says Lady Gaga is whoever the whoever she wants to be, basically, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> which. Which I love. Uh, I, I just I love the the. We'll get into the the third the tra- the trailer for the third one in, in a bit. But but yeah. So where do you? I guess what is which movie do you prefer? Like if you have to choose between Machete Machete Kills, mm. which one would you prefer? Like if the other one had to be erased from existence, which one would you want to stay around? Because like it's it I, they weirdly complement each other in that way. In it's kind of in the way that Planet Terror and Death Proof do, honestly. Yeah, definitely. I I don't know. I don't know. I think talking about the second one is very fun, but I I kind of feel like maybe watching the first one is more fun than watching the mm-hmm. second one, at least in terms of the rewatch. The first time I saw the second one, I was absolutely blown away and I had no idea what to say. Like, it's so ridiculous the first time you watch it. But then when you go back to it, and especially while watching the, these two back to back, the first one is a lot of action very minimal dialogue, particularly from um, uh, Treo, but really everyone else, like no one really talks too much in that movie aside from maybe Alba. Um, it, the second one on, on the, the other hand is a lot of discussions, a lot of jokes, a lot of um, exposition, which I don't mind, but I think for that reason, the second one's a little bit more fast paced and that might be the one that I would mm. pick if I were to pick between the two. Yeah. 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 I, I can see that. I like, I, I think the second one it's, it strikes me 
and this is what's frustrating about the fact that it's been seven years and we're we have still not gotten the third one. I forgot rewatching this the the second one today, how abrupt it ends. Like I knew it was a cliffhanger, but they're literally like, "All right, Machete, see you later." And they're like, "Machete will return." I'm like, "What the hell?" Oh, I forgot that there's <laughs> literally no denouement. It just ends, and yeah. it, it it bugged me. I guess maybe it's because there is no third movie sitting there waiting for me to put on right now, but. It's. It felt like this is. It, it really is kind of the Evil Dead Two of what I guess is supposed to be a machete trilogy, in that it starts out as, as one thing, and then by the end you're like, we're in a completely different realm. Uh, you know how mm. Evil Dead is just a horror movie. They're in a, you know in a cabin, shit goes bad. The second one kind of starts out like that, then leans into the comedy. Then before you know it, he's like a, an action hero with a, a chainsaw saw arm and spouting off catchphrases. And like you're in a different genre by the end of the second film, basically. Mm. And this that very much feels like what Machete Kills is, is that you start out in an yeah. exploitation grindhouse movie. And then by the end, you're in like a sci-fi, like a campy sci-fi <laughs> thriller situation. Yes. And it's... It's. I really want to see that pay off. It's. It's very frustrating as someone who who enjoys these movies and what Rodriguez is trying to do. Yeah, it's interesting as well because you you get the trailer for Machete Kills Again in Space at the start yeah. of the film, which tells you everything pretty much about what that third film is going to be, and then you end on that cliffhanger. But you already kind of know where it's going to go based off the opening trailer. But you still definitely want to see it because you don't know exactly how it plays out. But you do feel in a way... Because it's such a... It is such an abrupt ending, but I kind of like how abrupt it is because you already know exactly what's going to happen based off that mm-hmm. trailer, I think, anyway. Aside from who Lady Gaga is going to play, <laughs> that's probably the biggest cliffhanger. Well, and also the, the fact that um, the, he left it open purposefully because he's like, I'm never getting Mel Gibson to sign on for another one of these. So let's just put a mask mm-hmm. on and make him like a uh, Doctor Doom or a Black Mask sort of figure and then be like Leonardo DiCaprio, <laughs> actor subject to change. <laughs> <laughs> Which I yes. And, you know, Mel Gibson is, is a ton of fun in this movie. Uh, you know, his personal life, mm-hmm. obviously, aside... He, he's exactly the right sort of stunt casting for this character. And the fact that they give him this sort of precognition element of his character <laughs> is just, it feels yeah. like Rodriguez had a billion ideas and just put them all in here. And it works to the movie's benefit, I think. Uh, you, you have the Star Wars references, the land speeder, the Carbonite mm-hmm. thing, all of that. It's just... it Yeah. It does kind of fit in perfectly with the 80s as well, because the 80s were all about completely ripping off Star Wars. Right. Uh, the amount of sci-fi that we have covered on this year on the podcast, which is just just Star Wars ripoff after Star Wars ripoff, is ridiculous. And I think that this did perfectly like hit that level of complete ripoff, which is, yeah, why I do want to see that third film, because it would be great but i also don't think audiences will know what to make of it either right. maybe yeah yeah i feel like if it does happen it's happening like as a some kind of whatever streaming deal rodriguez gets it's going straight to not quibi but like, it's going straight to like hulu or el rey premium or whatever because now he's got the tv network and all that other stuff um it's it's definitely not gonna hit theaters i think if it happens but luckily you know yeah. he he's proven that he can do all of this on a budget so the first movie cost 10 million i don't i don't have in front of me exactly how much the second one costs but it's they're costly considering yeah 20 million dollars mm. for the second one oh, wow. it's they're yeah, costly the considering how much uh how how they're emulating these this low budget look and uh yeah so i don't know maybe you can get that if you can get that budget back down to 10 you can get somebody netflix someone to throw that money out there because danny trejo's not getting any younger and you know i really would like to see that happen uh i just love all the all the flourishes that he throws in these movies i want to see what he does with a a crazy sci-fi movie and who knows that could be his transition into actually doing a star wars movie like i was saying so yeah uh i yeah. You know, the third, the second one teases sort of um, Vaz's, I guess, agenda, plan, if you want to call it that, is to make an army of machetes. And I want to see that army of machetes. This is my whole thing. Definitely. Like, the, the trailer yeah, teases definitely. at the end. The There's sort of a, there's a trailer up front, but then there's, like, additional footage, I think, at the end, too, a little bit. 
It's mm. like an extended version. Yeah, there's of it. the there's the yeah the clone stuff really comes in right at the end. Yeah, which isn't in the right. First one. Right. So I want to see that payoff. Um, I want to see. I want to see uh, Michelle Rodriguez with like a bionic eye and uh, <laughs> and. Uh, the fact that we get the fact that the biggest the closest we get to that is machete kind of riding a missile for a minute at the end of the second one. It's just like wow, they're totally they're totally like Doctor Strange loving this right now. Uh, it's it's the moment uh, the the moment as well where, where he cuts the blue cable and somehow the missile is so close to the ground that it can just like slide along. Right, the water. exactly. It's so good. It's yeah. awesome. Oh, there's so many good jokes, and yeah, the um Michelle Rodriguez losing her eye for the second time is probably my favorite joke in machete kills as well it's it's so ridiculous like that and uh the precognition sound effect that plays Mm -hmm. whenever mel gibson mentions the incident is is so (laughs) perfect for that sort of film i think the the um michelle rodriguez blindness thing also is part of why i think machete the first one has such a once upon a time in mexico vibe for me, like it feels like he was already leaning towards doing a machete movie because have you seen Once Upon a Time in Mexico? Uh, I, 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 if I, if I have, it's been yeah. a while ago and I can't quite remember. I need to go back to his earlier stuff. I haven't really uh, seen too much of that. Yeah, I would definitely um, recommend yeah. to, you know to you and, and anyone listening to, to watch the El Mariachi trilogy. So El Mariachi, Desperado, and Once Upon a Time in Mexico because that's. That's an interesting uh, set of movies as well in that they each one sort of stands alone but also connects to each other. Like there's a continuous storyline, but they recap enough elements of the previous movies that you don't really need to see any of the other ones. Uh, mm. and, it, and I feel like Once Upon a Time in Mexico was him very much kind of leading into this sort of sprawling cast, like ultra like uh, crazy vibe. And, and Johnny Depp actually gets his character gets blinded in that movie in, you know, in a different way, but it always reminds me of that just from a visual standpoint. Mm. Uh, Yeah. 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 I, um, I will add them to my watch list now. I think I'm going to try and get to them pretty soon. Cause yeah, just based off this, I went, yeah, I really should just go back and watch everything that he's done that I haven't seen yet. So yeah, it feels like Rodriguez is, is like I said earlier on kind of an upswing. So I think it's a, it's a good time to refresh uh, refresh his, film, his filmography a little bit. And it's for mm. me, this was a good opportunity for me to do that. Uh, is there anything in the first movie, because since the first movie was an extension of the trailer, there are a lot of elements that, that were directly ripped from the trailer and expanded on. But there were mm. a lot of things like you can tell if you've watched the trailer a million times like I had before the movie <laughs> that they, you know, obviously reshot things or, or you know, there's a different line deliver, delivery, uh, particular from, particularly from Jeff Fahey in a lot of the uh, instances, who for me, yeah. I think is probably the MVP of that movie. I just think he's, he nails the tone so perfectly uh, in mm. the, in that first film as like the CD like, I don't know, second or third level villain who thinks he's the first level villain. Like whenever, he, whenever <laughs> Seagal's not telling, like ordering him what to do, like he walks around, like he is the main uh, antagonist of the movie. And then is completely, you know, cut down by uh, De Niro in that scene in the limo. Uh, I, I think he he's, yeah, he's just so much fun in this movie. Uh, what, is there anything in the, yeah. how did you think of this movie sort of building on the footage from the trailer and the way Rodriguez, mm-hmm. who I think, I think he shot like roughly 30 to 40 minutes of footage for the movie. Like wow. when they did the trailer, they shot a lot more than we saw. Did you, how do you feel that it built on, on that and incorporated that footage? I think it does a pretty good job from, um, yeah, I, I remember watching the trailer of Machete from Gr- Grindhouse and then pretty much just going to see Machete like directly after it. Um, and it did feel like that trailer was a trailer for this movie in many ways, uh, I think plot-wise, it perhaps the film goes in a different direction, mm. maybe. But the trailer is more about the action, isn't it? Like it's just more about the ridiculousness of like the action hero and and the random set pieces. That the are. priest with the shotgun, Cheech Marin showing up there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the Lindsay Lohan movie a uh, uh, moment is in the trailer as well, but that's not her in the trailer. No, so absolutely nice. not. No, that's not her in the trailer. I think they they do a uh, a little bit of a bait and switch there with the body double of it of it all. But they did that that same actress, the one whose face is visible 
uh, in the trailer is the same actress who returned to play uh, to play um, Jeff Fahey or Mrs. Booth in in the, the movie. So I thought that was cool that he kept that right. continuity. They had they didn't have to reshoot that scene from the trailer. They just made sure that you didn't see Lindsay Lohan's face at all in that in that moment. It just kept the same footage. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I thought that was great. Uh, the fact that this movie is so ballsy that he straight up crucifies the, the priest character. I'm like, wow. Um, <laughs> yes. And then comes back and is redeemed in the second right. as well. The other as another, priest. as his own, yeah. Tom Savini comes back and he's also a priest. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's some funny stuff. Uh, I also noticed, the, yeah, the go ahead. The harmless kind of singlet he's wearing has also got like the priest collar. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So good. Yeah. I did notice uh, upon this rewatch that um, Senator McLaughlin in the first one and the chameleon in the second one both die because they are mistaken for Mexicans. And I think it's the same. Billy Blair is in the first one as uh, Don Johnson. I can't believe we didn't mention Don Johnson, who has kind of started like this. I feel like this was the beginning of him playing kind of redneck cowboys in a lot of things after this, because he even shows up in Watchmen mm-hmm. with a very similar performance style, uh, at least at first. And I, th- I, I yeah. think... Um, I think that that's really fun to see how his career kind of leaned into this a little bit more. And both of those movies have that, that sequence where Billy Blair is one of John Johnson's uh, like henchmen. And he's in, I believe both movies and I think might be the person that kills both of those people. I don't remember, but he definitely showed up in the second one. And it just goes to show kind of the, the exploitation aspect of the, these movies that as soon as, as soon as the chameleon crosses into us, it's like, Oh, they're taken out. Um, It's just like, yeah, uh, yeah, that's pretty much how the U S feels sometimes. Um, What were your thoughts on on the De Niro scene in particular? And the fact that he survives uh, April's, uh, gunshot because of the bulletproof vest and then it's taken down in the similar fashion to the way we see him killing Mexicans crossing over the border. Mm. I think that's that's spot on for this style yeah. of movie because there's always a a death fake out in like B movies and like grindhouse stuff. There's always that fake out and I think having it be De Niro as well is perfect because he's he's such a high caliber actor that it did feel a little weird the way that Lohan killed him. And then, like, yeah, like, he's the, the perfect actor to have two death scenes in a movie as well. Because, like, you want that. You, you know, he's great in those scenes. And um, the way the way that he is eventually killed is, is it's, it's, such a, it's such a De Niro moment. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, it's such a moment. Like, it it fits in perfectly with who he is as an actor, that whole sequence. Um, yeah. He's great in this movie. Though, I, isn't he? like he's, just... I forgot how, I mean, that was one of my like, you know, notes that I made to myself was hot take Robert De Niro, pretty good actor. <laughs> just want, <laughs> even in this, yeah. like, like I forgot that he really commits to not only the style of the movie, but his, sort of unapologetic nature of that character. The fact that he goes in and out of the Southern accent, like, and just completely changes his demeanor, you know, when he's on the campaign trail, then when he's behind closed doors, like, you know, he's the George W. Bush kind of figure to his, his Mm. uh, supporters. And then behind closed doors, he's basically Robert De Niro, like from every Scorsese movie. Uh, And I, I I thought that that was great. He's basically essentially playing two characters in this movie. Mm, Yeah, definitely it's it's fascinating to me that they managed to get him in this mm-hmm. film i he like the, it considering that it only cost 10 million i feel like de niro is the sort of actor who doesn't really do anything for fun unless it is like a scorsese film a lot of the stuff he does just kind of feel like He's there for the paycheck, even though like he's amazing in pretty much right. everything. Aside from maybe um that film with Zach Efron from Oh yeah, yeah. Mexico. Um but like it does feel like he's doing this because he wants to do it, which is just amazing. And the fact that he's so good in it is yeah. It's such a strange performance based off like the poster and everything, because you see that De Niro's in this and you're like, well, that's a strange casting choice. 
just alongside everyone else in the movie, he does kind of stick out and you're like, what, what, what is De Niro doing in this? And then he just delivers one of the most charismatic performances of recent memory from him, particularly from the last, I don't know, like 10 mm. years. And yeah, yeah, it's excellent. He's so yeah. Cool. And it not only, you know, leans into the whole stunt casting element of Grindhouse movies where in Werewolf Woman of the SS, you have Nicolas Cage, Oscar winner, showing up as Fu Manchu like it's kind of it, it it feels very much of that of that piece that yeah sure you get a, a bit a name to come in and shoot this for a couple of days or whatever and I think the fact that Rodriguez has such complete control creative control of his movies that he has his own studio that he has all these uh you know all these assets and everything mm-hmm. that he can turn things around very quickly um famously he he made sin city on obviously all green screen but he he he's very deft at uh at editing and so he had like uh mickey rourke and elijah wood had a fight never met just shot with body doubles Mm -hmm. things like that so it makes me feel like de niro came in did his stuff in like a few days a week or two maybe and then peaced out and so he was able to keep the budget as low as possible, but still attract these big names. Just like, Hey, come in Mel Gibson. It'll be like three days. We'll shoot your stuff. And then, you know, half the movie you're wearing, you know, the last couple of scenes you're wearing a mask anyway, we can get whoever to wear that. Like, you know, he, he's creative in that he finds ways. It's that whole, you know, um, I forget what the term is. I, I always forget this phrase, but it's like, you know, necessity is the mother of invention basically. So it's like, I need to keep this yeah. budget down but I still want to attract the same level of talent. So he finds ways to make that all make, make that all work and make the puzzles all fit together. The puzzle pieces rather fit all yeah. so that he's able to deliver a movie like machete, which costs $10 million, but has like, you know, $80 million worth of star power, you know? <laughs> yeah. And that's perhaps the thing about Seagal in this movie that doesn't quite work as well as everyone else because i think it's pretty obvious that his stuff was filmed in maybe a day or two days Mm -hmm. and he's very separate from everyone else because yeah half of him in this film actually maybe even three quarters is essentially facetime (laughs) yeah it's just yeah pretty (laughs) much it's rodriguez is like hey let's just we'll just do what you know we'll skype you into this movie for, for everything but like your fight scene and your your confrontation with machete at the beginning and that's yeah that's really all that he the only interaction he has with anyone else on screen yeah aside from his final face off with machete <laughs> which is still such a funny sequence and perhaps anticlimactic but i love it because of uh, this this is nothing ah oh, fuck it <laughs> like, twist it around <laughs> as, as exaggeratedly as he possibly can for this kind of movie oh, that's great uh, is there yeah. um we we also have to mention of course you know all the the graininess on the screen that he carries over from uh grindhouse i feel like he kind of dropped that in the second one though i didn't notice that so much mm. I, I i yeah 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 i um I I had a I I've, I've got the first one on DVD and then the, the second one on Blu-ray and yeah yeah I don't think there's aside from the trailers at the start and the end I don't think there's any film grain in that yeah I think one. the only thing that he that he messes with is uh, the sex scene with Amber Heard which of course you know that's par for the course with these Grindhouse movies but it goes to 3D and then suddenly you're like. <laughs> You know, a teenager watching, trying to watch scrambled pay per view for like a minute, while it's uh, well, while that happens. So I thought that was that was kind of a fun touch. But he doesn't really, yeah, he doesn't really mess with that as much in, in the second one. Which, you know, maybe he could have done a little bit more with that. But like I said, by the by the second movie, it, it is basically it, it is a different genre. So he doesn't really, maybe he doesn't didn't mm. feel as beholden to that style. Uh, it would have been cool to see him do it a little bit, maybe the first you know, maybe the first half or something until there's that sequence. Like I actually finished watching the movie today, but I watched part of it like several days ago and I ended right at the part where uh, machete gets shot up and then passes out. And I was like, well, that's yeah. the perfect place to end this because then it becomes a sci-fi movie in the next, the next scene, like even more. So mm. like it's, it's the first one's a grindhouse. The second one is, is leans even more into the James Bond until that moment. Then you're in like, you're yeah, you're in like, uh, un, uh, like R-rated Flash Gordon or something at that point. It's <laughs> yeah. uh, 
Yeah. yeah so it, it, it does take a lot of strange narrative turns. So I wonder if maybe he could have implemented some of that up to that point and then dropped it and made that genre shift even more apparent. I don't know, but yeah, well, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of green screen work in the second one, which I noticed, which is perhaps more noticeable because there isn't a film grain either, but I think perhaps making the, the green screen elements more noticeable does improve the film a little bit, particularly in the more sci-fi mm-hmm. elements. Yeah. Like there's so many sequences where it's so obvious that Mel Gibson is just standing on a green screen stage and the background is completely painted in. But I think that adds to the Star Wars ripoff nature of the film, considering that every movie from the seventies and eighties that was doing that looked like this. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> Yeah, it shouldn't be. I, that's why it's crazy to me that it was twenty million for the second one, because it should be much. You know, if they're maybe they're using techniques from like the eighties. It shouldn't be that expensive, unless a lot of that went to Mel Gibson. I have to imagine that maybe that that was. <laughs> he's like, all right, I'll do it, but five million or something. I'm getting of that, and there went like a quarter of the budget. I, I'm not sure exactly what happened there, but yeah, uh, you know. Is there anything from Machete or Machete Kills that we haven't talked about that you want to make sure we get into? Um, probably some performances in the second one. I mean, Vanessa Hudgens shows up. Like two seconds, I, yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. Is this before or after Spring Breakers? I don't know, because she made that very almost jarring shift from Disney movies to R-rated stuff in the early 2010s. I, I this, can't remember if Spring this Breakers. This is was right. This is the year after Spring Breakers. So she's kind okay. of right in that zone, yeah. Yeah, and she's great. I'm surprised that she doesn't get credited in the opening sequence because um, out of the majority of the female performances, hers is one that always kind of stood out to me. I think she's great in this movie. Uh, I, I, but, but, of course, Alexa mm-hmm. Baker as well from Spy Kids returns in this. Well, yeah, yeah, she does, which is, always makes me feel a little bit icky because she is so sexualized in this movie because she does have like the assless chaps yeah. basically and you know that rodriguez yeah, worked with her that... as like a, a 12 year old so i'm like yeah i don't know how i feel about this i mean she looks great yeah. but at the same time <laughs> i don't know this feels wrong on some level yeah i i i agree i i always feel qu- quite weird in those scenes particularly in that one where yeah she does turn around and then the the riff from spike Kids mm-hmm. plays it's like hey look which is carmen's a- all grown up and now you want to <laughs> fuck her and i'm like i don't know i don't know if i appreciate that machete kills yeah it's strange i think maybe if um i can't remember the actor's name but if the the the, the other guy from spike kids returns oh yeah well, daryl sabera and who it, yeah, if he returned in a similar fashion, perhaps right. that could have been pretty funny. But because it's just her, it's a little... Yeah, weird. he's in the first one without really that much to do either. He's just part of the network. Mm. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it was. I did notice the Alexa Vega of it all. And she doesn't really have much of a character. She's just, uh, you know, objective. They're there to be objectified, basically. Which is, you know, again, yeah. fine in a way for this kind of movie because that's what they're doing. And Sofia Vergara clearly knows that she's just, you know, she's going around she's being like, Oh, you I blew my load, you know, to, to uh, machete and things like that. <laughs> like she's totally playing it up and everyone else is too. But Alexa Vega feels like she's not a hundred percent in on the joke. Um, and it's, mm. I think that's the difference there. I did like in the second one, uh, Marco Zoror who plays uh, the henchman. He's a martial artist and he's, you know, a kickboxer and and, a, and kind of a um, a stunt man who worked with like The Rock and things like that. And he shows up in this one as the the henchman of Vaz's that is like cloned ad nauseum was was the I guess the the mm. subject for the cloning uh, experiment that he did. So mm. I thought he brought a lot of um, you know fighting prowess and and presence to that role to what was essentially just you know. A, a silent villain uh, henchman thing. Yeah, I, he's credited as himself, I think, as well. I think the character is meant to be. Yeah, him, I think so. Which is something I noticed. Yeah, which is funny. Uh, any, let's see, anything from the first one? Because now you mentioned performances. I'm like, well, we mentioned Damien P- Bashir and how great he is, and all the all the chameleon people. Yeah. Charlie Sheen, we mentioned about the, how the fact that he's even in here as the president, <laughs> uh, who of course yes. has 
sleeps with three women, legalizes marijuana. Naturally, this is would be like with Charlie yeah. Sheen as president. Uh, he's um he's credited as which, Carlos again Estevez Perfect. as well, which is excellent. Introducing, Introducing. Carlos Estevez. I love it. <laughs> which is good. Um, we haven't really talked about Amber Heard. I, uh, she's not great in this film. I don't think. I think. It's interesting with her and Mel Gibson in, in, in particular because they are perhaps the quite well, no, not perhaps they are definitely the problematic casting choices that, that don't one hundred percent hold up. But it's interesting that with, for Mel Gibson in, in particular, the joke is him. He's the joke. You're laughing mm-hmm. at him. You're not necessarily laughing because any because of anything he says. It feels like Amber Heard's the like she's trying to make a lot of jokes, and I don't think her performance pulls it off. I think they all fall pretty flat. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I, I, yeah, I think yeah. she's had you had had you had a an actress in there that could pull off that sort of femme fatale thing. I think it would have made that character a lot more memorable. But as she is, she's memorable because she's attractive, and that's about it. Like, th- there's a good idea yeah. there where the fact that she's you know, a government agent who who went rogue and and is sort of uh, you know her cover is a beauty pageant contestant. Which that, that's a smart idea and a a good excuse to get a hot actress to wear bikinis and, you know, uh, outfits like that in a movie, but it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't really, it doesn't really come together. I think in, in the way that it, it would have that it did on the page basically. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's some other moments of the opening sequence in the second one with Jessica Alba. Every time I see it, um, cause I usually watch these back to back every time I see it and she shows up like, like with the Bella Clava on, I'm always like, oh, that's right. They couldn't get Alba back. And so they just have her killed off, like wearing a mask. And then she takes it off and you're like, oh, wait, no, they did get her back. That's right. That's really cool. <laughs> but she's in this film for like five Yeah. Minutes. Yeah. Uncredited, of course, yeah. because yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I feel like we've hit a lot of, is there any, any of the other crazy moments we missed? I feel like we touched on the, the intestines moments, which are the, oh, the beginning of the yep. first one where uh, the henchwoman pulls the, the gun out of her uh, crotch area. Oh, yep. <laughs> perfect, perfect uh, grindhouse kind of B-movie uh, sort of shocking development. I, I, I love that. And I always forget yeah. about it, too. And then when it happens, like, oh, my God, that's right. She just did that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I like how full on the n- nudity is in that opening sequence as well, because then afterwards there's the scene with Jessica Alba, but that's pretty much like painted mm-hmm. over, yep. I think. Um, yeah. So just stuff like that is really good in the first one as well. The, uh, the henchman that Machete <laughs> constantly attacks with gardening tools. Oh yeah. That, that whole thing. I, I love those, so those guys in general, they have the whole conversation where they're like, you know, I don't know. I don't think the boss is a good guy. I think we're, we're in the raw and they're like, Hey, watch your mouth. Where's your loyalty? Like again, feel like they're <laughs> yeah. ripped out of a Scorsese movie in a way. Uh, like, Hey, mm. shut, shut your face. What are you talking about? That kind of thing. And then to the point where that yeah. one guy is just like, oh, I quit. Here you go. I'm out here. I don't want to be a part of this. I, I love that. <laughs> that it's, it's perfect. It's, yeah, yeah it's awesome. <laughs> He's trying to pick up the, um, the phone or the gun or something. And, <laughs> and Trey has got like the, um, the whippersnipper and it's just like hitting his hand over and over again. He's like, ah, I can't get it. It goes on. For yeah, like it minutes. does. It's such a long sequence. There's this, there's the scene, I think in the very beginning of the movie where he cuts a guy's hand off and then he picks up the hand with the gun on it and kind of shoots people with the, with the, uh, with the hand gun, literally. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I feel like we, we've done a pretty <laughs> nice, uh, coverage. I did love the moment I mentioned mm. earlier about Jeff Fahey, and uh, Steven Seagal and sort of being like uh, the the Emperor Palpatine to Jeff Fahey's uh, Vader, I guess, since we're, we're you mm. know, these movies clearly like to to uh, make very blatant Star Wars references. Uh, <laughs> the the part where he's like, oh, are you going to stand for this? This guy who failed you, who's actually Shea Wiggum, who's been in a lot of other movies and stuff since then. Uh, and he's like and he and he says like, no, you know, something like that. And he basically chokes him out on the screen to prove how, how badass he is to Steven Seagal. That whole sequence. I love yeah. that. I thought that was such a like dick measuring contest between the two of them. Really, really fun. Yeah. yeah. Ah, yeah. It was, um, it was great to see Shea Wiggum in there as, as well, because he has become such a, not necessarily notable name, but he's in a lot yeah. now, like fast and furious, uh, uh, Kong, 
Uh, Joker? Sicario, I believe he's in that as well. And First Man, I remember being a really good performance for him. For, for yeah, him. he's 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 truly and, become one of those, that guy's, one of those character actors that mm. you see in everything. Like, he's in like five movies a year and you're like, hey, that guy again. That's what he's up to. Yeah. Yeah. And he's excellent in this. Yeah. He's he really is. Yeah. Phenomenal. So much fun. We said Lindsay Lohan, how she becomes a nun, a nun with a gun, basically, um, which is sort of teased, I think, earlier. Our our big takeaway is these movies are a lot of fun. Go see them if you haven't. Perfect kind of like uh, quarantine viewing, too. Just throw this at ho- on at home and, and you know, make a bunch of popcorn and just go for it. And, and Rodriguez, if you're listening, which you're probably not, but if you are, Machete kills again in space. The people have spoken. <laughs> <laughs> we want to see this happen. We want to see Machete happen. Uh, please make it. Yeah. What if What if he does make the third one, but it's a sequel to Machete Kills in Space? Like it picks up at the end of that. That would be fine too. I, honestly, I, yeah. It's weird that you mentioned that because it feels like if you if you watch when you go back and watch Once Upon a Time in Mexico, there are sequences in that that are flashbacks, but not to a previous movie. They're like a flashbacks to a movie that happened in between movies. So it almost feels like the fourth mm. El Mariachi movie in a way um, because of that. So if you wanted to do that, that's fine. I just want to, I'm obsessed with trilogies <laughs> and I love, I, I hate <laughs> yeah. when a trilogy is left un, unfinished. Like I'm still, I, I'm still every once in a while, like at least once a year or whatever, I'll still Google. So what is going on with Hellboy three? Are they ever going to make that? Because finish <laughs> yeah. this, like you started something, see it through to the end. Uh, and Mm. I will. I love the idea of Rodriguez doing one more of these to finish this trilogy. He's got his Spy Kids his trilogy. He's got his El Mariachi trilogy. Give us one more machete, and then you know, then you can put the character to bed. I don't need like six of them or anything. But you you promised you know us in be... space, so let's let's make it happen now. Yeah. <laughs> you know what would be amazing if Rodriguez, and I think he is quite self aware about the fact that he did this a lot in the early 2000s, but Machete 3D. Yeah, do it. Hell yeah. I think that would be <laughs> so much fun. I would love that. I would love to see any, yeah, I would love to see anything else with this franchise just because it, you know, obviously our whole conversation is predicated on the fact that this is not high art. This is obviously the lowest of <laughs> art. Like this is just going for pure uh, adrenaline, pure thrills, pure, you know, cinematic madness, basically. And I think that there's nothing wrong with that. I feel like sometimes movies like this get, get, you know, uh, get the shaft basically just because they're not, you know, they're not trying to be, uh, you know, awards contenders or anything like that. It's like, there's, there is a place for this kind of movie and we aren't seeing very many of them these days. And, you know, I would like to see this one vision completed before they, they move on to other things. And um, so, yeah, that's kind of my thing, especially as a Rodriguez fan, a long time Rodriguez fan, and feels like he's sort of back in this sci-fi realm now with Alita. It's like, let's, let's get that happen. Let's get that together. Uh, Danny Trejo, 76 years old. Come on before <laughs> let's, yeah. while he can still move around and swing a machete. Let's, let's do that. It mm-hmm. shouldn't take that long for Rodriguez to pull that together uh, we know he has the skill set. He could probably make this in his garage. So let's just make that happen already. Yeah. I mean, it took them a month to film the second one. So, yeah, like he could probably get this over. Yeah, quickly. exactly. I think he's just, you know, I don't know if it's just a schedule thing that he's super busy. I think it's mostly a financing is what it is. Like nobody wants to put yeah. the money forward for that. So just need, you know, honestly, I'm not necessarily uh, always the biggest proponent of this. But if he did do like a Kickstarter or something for this, people would throw money at it. <laughs> like the hardcore 100%. Rodriguez machete fans would, I mean, look, we got a Veronica Mars movie out of nowhere. And that yeah. cost, I don't know, probably I think less than 10 million around there, but it, you know, he could probably get it down enough that to cover that for part of it, just cr- put it, put up uh, everybody's names that contributed at the end in the credits or whatever, and just get it together. Come on, Rodriguez, do it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, it is a shame that the second one was so like critically panned. I think it might have even been nominated for some Golden Raspberries, w- which feels annoying because the point is that it's not right. very good either. Right. So therefore, I think it succeeded in not being very good because that's the point yeah. of the film. Um, so yeah, I just just I hope that he wasn't disheartened by that uh, reception and and is 
planning to do another one. Like, which I think he is because he keeps talking about it in interviews. Yeah, so. every once in a while, either Rodriguez or Trejo will bring it up and they'll be like, it's still happening. We still want to do it. I'm like, when? <laughs> it's been a long time. Yeah. Come on, let's let's do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think we did a pretty good job sort of going through the Machete movies uh, as well as Grindhouse and sort of, I mean, we even talked, shit, we even talked about Hobo with a Shotgun. We kind of wrapped in the whole Grindhouse <laughs> enchilada, I guess, pun intended, uh, nice. uh, in this episode. So if there's nothing else, Sandro Falce, can you tell people where they can find you on social media? For sure. Um, the great thing about having a name like mine is that the usernames are completely free. So you can <laughs> yeah, follow you me everywhere. At S-A-N-D-R-O-F-A-L-C-E is where I am. Uh, yeah, the podcast is Oldie But A Goodie. We might have an Instagram account by the time this goes out. We've been working on that for a while, but just haven't really uh, started one yet. But it might be out by the time this episode's out. I'm not too sure. Um, but yeah, that shows a lot of fun episodes every week. Uh, coming up near the end of the year, we're doing stuff like Dune, um, which I'm pretty sure is going to coincide with the new... Ooh. Nice film synergy. As well. They both I love came it. out in the same yeah, in the same area. And I'm probably reading the book right now to get ready for that episode. So I'm excited for that one in December. Uh and then the other podcast is called Nerd Out, uh, which you can find everywhere as well, just under that name. Um so yeah, that's me. And thanks for having me on again. It's been fun. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like I said, big Rodriguez fan. So as soon as you mentioned this, I was like, oh, sold. I, I had been meaning to get the uh, the second Machete movie on DVD anyway, so when I got your email, I just ordered it on Amazon. I was like, we're good to go. Let's make it happen. Um, so yeah, so thank you yeah. for bringing Machete to the table. We'll definitely have to have you on to talk about something, again, completely different. I love how we went from pop star to Machete. So we'll have to find another mm. drastic shift in, in uh, material for the next time you come on. Yeah, definitely. But like with a small a small way to connect them. Is there any way to connect pop star and machete? Probably. I don't know. I have to think about that one. Uh, I um, mean, we said about how machete is kind of a satire and I mean, pop star definitely is. So I guess, yeah. Oh, and they, they both kind of bombed as well in the box office. They both yeah. Yeah. Well. That's true. They're both, that they're both the underappreciated. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So next time we've got to find another movie that's a satire and bombed. <laughs> there you go. Box office disasters that have a satirical edge, and uh, yeah, and that people need to check out. Perfect. Awesome. That that's your that's your homework for next time. All right. <laughs> Thanks, good. guys. Thanks, Sandra. If you're interested in joining me on the show to chat about one of your favorite films, head on over to crookedtable.com/guest. Or you can consider supporting the show at patreon.com slash crookedtable. Of course, you can always find more podcasts, reviews, videos, and other movie-related goodies over at crookedtable.com. Until next time, this has been the Crooked Table Podcast, and I've been Rob. This has been a production of crookedtable.com. All rights reserved. Z-R-O-O-K-E-D. Z-R-O-O-K-E-D. <laughs>